Concrete costs less in the long run. Concrete lasts longer with less need for maintenance and repair. Concrete is quiet. Concrete is safer. Concrete is environmentally friendly. Concrete Paving Association of Minnesota. Quick, easy construction. Easy design capabilities. Outperforms competitive materials. Doesn't your community deserve smooth, attractive asphalt roadways? America's best communities choose asphalt. Shouldn't it be your choice? Don't be rigid in your pavement thinking. Choose asphalt, the versatile paving material. Customer satisfaction, economical, speed of construction, durability, versatility, recyclability, smooth and quiet maintenance application. Minnesota Asphalt Pavement Association. Chapter 15. Public Roads and Private Cars. 15.1. White Top and Black Top. Flexible asphalt versus rigid concrete. It seems a strange battle even to those of us steeped in transportation. In many states, consolidated pavement manufacturers sell the appropriate material for the job. However, for whatever historical reason, in Minnesota, the producers remain small and their associations have chosen to compete over the fixed pie of pavement surfacing and resurfacing rather than coalesce to increase the amount of pavement demanded. They promote competing studies arguing in favor of their material. Historically, low-volume roads have gone asphalt and high-volume roads have gone concrete, and they compete at the margins. Since there are many more miles of low-volume roads, there is a great deal more asphalt on the ground. Differences in pavements, of course, are but one aspect of highways, an aspect that makes little difference to the transportation itself, aside from minor adjustments to costs and delays during construction. Yet, in the aggregate, pavements are a huge industry and a large element of the transportation experience that we would be remiss to miss. The difference between asphalt and concrete is much less than the difference between paved and unpaved. Like the debate between Telford and McAdam, see sections 3.5 and 3.4, in the early 19th century, the battle between asphalt and concrete is both slow, puerile, and futile. A combination of the two, for example concrete with asphalt overlay, often makes the best technique, though the sides are often too competitive to see it. In response to pavement advocates, Francis Turner, one time head of the U.S. Bureau of Public Roads, would sometimes close the debate by adjusting, the interstate is a balanced system. One half of the mileage is concrete, the other half is asphalt. Thomas MacDonald, his predecessor, had no prejudices for asphalt or concrete, but wanted the best for the job, which meant balancing costs and benefits, as overbuilding was as much a problem as underbuilding. In the United States, the modern auto-truck paved highway system dates from the mass-produced automobile. Example, the Ford Model T around 1910. Of course, there had long been roads and personal transportation. So one might say that steam, electric, and internal combustion engine vehicles triggered a new realization of old systems, though their birth dated from many centuries ago. The automobile and truck offered increased performance, higher horsepower per ton, and eventually lower costs compared to animal propulsion systems. This enabled a renewal or transformation of the precursor system, or, if you wish, the birth of the modern system. The title of Barker and Gerhold's The Rise and Rise of Road Transport mirrors the renewal situation. Much has been accomplished since the early 1900s. It was decided what governments would do versus what private actors would do. Funding responsibilities were set. Learning about system capabilities occurred, and the system was deployed. Some key matters in automobile development were the availability of high-energy fuels, the shift from the steerable front axle to steerable front wheels, the use of specialized labor in Fordist mass production, and the adoption of interchangeable parts. Interestingly, it took until the 1930s for the predominant design of the automobile and truck to emerge. Process of production technology was also well developed by about that time. Development took off in the United States. It is said that circumstances were first ready in the United States where incomes and preferences supported the development of mass markets and enabled mass production. It is instructive to compare the time constants describing market penetration in various environments, say the time required to go from 5% to 95% of market saturation. This required about seven decades in the United States, two to three decades in Western Europe, and a little over one decade in Japan. That partly has to do with the rise of incomes in those areas. We might expect places that began to automobilize after the United States to automobilize faster than the United States did. Because the technology had been standardized, only emulation was required. But the notion that, in, that the environment was somehow ready in the United States and not in the other places is harder to explain. The time constants for vehicle market saturation compare in an interesting way with the deployment of improved roads. Comparison of the S-shaped deployment curves for roads and vehicles suggests that road improvements led and vehicle populations followed. In fact, there were many roads before motor vehicles. That observation raises an interesting question about causality and system deployment. The automobile and truck appeared in environments where road improvements were underway. 
Motorized vehicles begged incremental changes, including pavements to keep down dust and protect the road surface, to reduce vehicle damage, and stronger pavements to carry loads, bridge improvements, increased capacity, and design changes to allow for higher velocities. Many pre-automobilization design protocols were unchanged. For example, the higher horsepower per unit of weight of motorized vehicles would have enabled much steeper grades. The critical road grade for a wagon was downhill. The then-current brake technology allowed for a grade of about 2%, which was the maximum load horses or mules could hold back. Although special facilities for heavy vehicles were discussed in the early 19th century, the idea of iron roads, the protocol of limited specialization of the road to vehicles and operations continued. Specialized designs, truck-only, auto-only highways, were discussed in the 1920s and 30s, but, except for a few parkways, such as those developed by Robert Moses in New York, see section 22.3.4, those designs were never adopted. See section 22.6.2 for discussion of the topic. The system characteristics of automobiles, trucks, and highway facilities were frozen when the predominant technology hardened in the 1930s. The roads, vehicles, and operations developed by the end of the 1930s have been deployed, and today only modest polishing changes are underway. That's true in the sweep of history in spite of, if not because of, the increasing number of regulations affecting vehicles and highway designs. There is more to be said about the emergence of highways, and this chapter explores their policy, planning, deployment, and management. Although some aspects of state activities are treated in the discussion of the evolution of modern urban transportation planning system, the present discussion extends Chapter 7 and aims to provide a coherent view of the emergence of modern paved highways. We will see that three levels of policy and planning evolved, federal, state, and local. In some states, there is a fair amount of articulation between county and state planning. In others, there is not. Fifteen point two auto trails. To say that the country did not recognize the auto for what it was is to understate the case. The country recognized the auto as a rattling piece of machinery that could be counted on to break down every three or four miles. Norman Bel Geddes, Magic Motorways. By nineteen twelve, Carl Fisher, auto dealer, land developer, racetrack entrepreneur, headlight company founder, launched a new project, a transcontinental rock highway running from New York to California. While the idea was not original, the National Old Trails Road Association was already promoting a road from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles, and the idea was in the air. Fisher was the necessary promoter to get it done. Fisher planned to build the road incrementally, piecing together existing segments and filling the voids with new construction, upgrading the whole thing over time. He wanted car makers and auto dealers to contribute one-third of one percent of their gross revenue for three years to help pay for the route which would be built by volunteers and governments. Funds came from Goodyear Tire, cement magnate A.Y. Gowan, and automakers Hudson, now run by Roy Chapin, Willis, still led by founder John Willis, and Packard, run by Henry Joy. But Ford resisted, stating, as long as private interests are willing to build good roads for the general public, the general public will not be very interested in building good roads for itself. Henry Joy became the leader of the group to build a coast-to-coast -coast rock highway, which was soon renamed the Lincoln Highway. He predicted by 1915 coast-to-coast -coast travels would be com complete in as few as 11 days. Fisher also promoted the Dixie Highway, Chicago and Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, to Miami, which was actually one eastern and one western highway following parallel paths, as the compromise was easier to agree upon than the single route. With periodic connectors, the route upgraded nearly 4,000 miles, 6,400 kilometers, of dirt and poor-quality asphalt trails to concrete and brick. Other auto trails were established as well. Each was designed with a distinct signage, each positioning itself as the most efficient or the most scenic. They could not be both. The most famous beyond the Lincoln Highway were the National Old Trails Road, Baltimore to Los Angeles, Bankhead Highway, Washington, D.C. to San Diego, Atlantic Highway, Fort Kent, Maine to Miami, Jefferson Highway, Winnipeg to New Orleans, and Pacific Highway, Port Angeles, Washington to San Diego. Though, there were at least 250 U.S. and Canadian highways and trails pumped by promoters and designated by distinct organizations. Many of the more important U.S. routes were mapped onto the much more rational numbered U.S. highway systems, and of course many of the trails used common road segments. However, the named routes were not given a single number, instead being assigned to portions of multiple numbered routes, to the dismay of most route associations. The Lincoln Highway, the most important of the routes, was mostly designated U.S. 30 from the east coast to Salt Lake City. The Boy Scouts of America placed 3,000 concrete markers along the Lincoln Highway route to commemorate the 16th president, and then the Lincoln Highway Association disbanded in 1928. 
The Yoda Trails were seen by some as the start of something greater. Thomas MacDonald, 1881-1957, later leader of the Bureau of Public Roads, was one such visionary. He called the Lincoln Highway the first outlet for the road-building energies of this community. New farm-to-market roads were valued as a way to reduce costs and increase productivity of farmers, recreational motorists wanted long-distance intercity routes, while urban interests valued a different set of roads. What MacDonald had in mind was federalizing the problem rather than relying on a set of national associations to build roads. The American Association of State Highway Organizations, ASHO, the Organization of State Highway Agencies, developed national standards for numbering routes, the map, how signs would work, and so on. The U.S. Highway Numbering System, developed by Edwin James, even routes were east-west, odd routes were north-south, with the important routes on the zeros and ones and fives, starting numbering in the north and east, was later reconfigured for the interstate highway system, with important routes on the zeros and fives, and starting the numbering in the south and west to avoid confusion. Fifteen point three, safe streets. The International Classification of Diseases defines roads as a location where death occurs. A public highway, trafficway, or street is the entire width between property lines or other boundary lines of every way or place, of which any part is open to the use of the public for purposes of vehicular traffic as a matter of right or custom. A roadway is that part of the public highway designed, improved, and ordinarily used for vehicular travel. The classifiers have already conceded roads to the owners of vehicles, a transition that occurred in the early 20th century. Traffic deaths, as of 2011, running about 33,000 a year in the United States, exceeded 20,000 in 1924 and 32,000 in the year 1940, with far fewer vehicles and miles traveled. Who controls the streets? Historically, the pedestrian could use the entire street, cross at will, and there was no such thing as jaywalking. Only with the automobile and the subsequent establishment of traffic control laws was the pedestrian reined in for safety and motorized mobility. Local safety councils advocated for safety in the new environment with lethal automobiles. Some of the local organizations were large. By 1922, St. Louis's Safety Council had over 25,000 members. Exhortation was one strategy the safety organization used, with their iconic character, Otto No Better, who did everything unsafely. The council established safety weeks and other strategies of moral suasion to improve driver behavior. Juries were generally sympathetic to pedestrians in the early 1920s, blaming motorists for most crashes, even when fault was mixed or the pedestrians. In part, this was a class issue. The average motorist was wealthier than the average pedestrian or jury member. Similarly, Two-thirds of police chiefs believed automobiles should have speed controls. Over time, the safety movement ultimately but subtly shift blame from careless motorists, who in the 1920s were still widely blamed, who ought to drive more safely, to their victim, the pedestrian. Clearly, it takes two to have an externality, the polluter and the polluted. Each needs to take some responsibility. But in the end, someone has a right to establish the status quo. Some blamed congestion on the automobile, others on the street. Too much demand and not enough supply are two sides of the same coin. But where you come down depends on whether you think there should be more cars and roads, or fewer. To the auto interests, road builders, and prospective motorists, the answer was obvious. William Phelps Eno's Traffic Safety Foundation established a set of rules of the road that became widely, though not universally or uniformly, adopted. Known as the Father of Traffic Safety, Eno, 1858-1945, designed traffic plans for some of the world's great cities, and wrote the first street traffic code for New York. He is credited with a stop sign, crosswalk, traffic circle, one-way street, taxi stand, and pedestrian safety island. It was widely believed that application of scientific principles to traffic control could have congestion. Zoning, the control of land use, and traffic control were two prongs of the larger progressive movement, aiming to reduce chaos and increase order in the city moving traffic control from the police with their ad hoc ways to a systematic engineering profession was the realization of this plan. But engineers needed to be trained. This was a new field. In 1925, noted traffic engineer and the first PhD in the field, Miller McClintock, 1894-1960, established the Bureau of Street Traffic Research at the University of California, Los Angeles. After gaining a grant from Studebaker, McClintock set up a Bureau of Street Traffic Research at Harvard University within the Graduate School of Engineering. The center was named for Studebaker's president, Albert Russell Erskine. 
The Bureau of Highway Traffic, which started at Harvard, then moved to Yale in 1938, and then to Pennsylvania State University in 1968 for several decades, trained the elites in U.S. transportation engineering. Since 2009, Miller McClintock's grandson, Thomas Miller McClintock, has served in the U.S. House of Representatives from California as a Republican. Engineers competed against others for authority. The existing streetcar systems had long managed their own ways and could make a claim to manage roads. But as streetcars were themselves being decommissioned in favor of buses, this argument was losing. On the Twin Cities line, Motorman Bill, a local iconic character, pled for consideration for motorists. Jaywalking was criminalized to control the pedestrian, reduce crashes, and improve the environment for the motorist. Sidewalks became the exclusive paths for pedestrians and the road for vehicles. Conflicts would remain at intersections, but mid-block conflicts declined. At intersections, traffic lights and the silent policemen, small traffic circles, replaced the corner man and greatly improved traffic efficiency on urban streets. The Yellow Cap Company implemented traffic lights in Chicago's downtown loop to aid pedestrians at the price of annoying motorists. Traffic signal timing on a grid, establishing the green wave to allow motorists traveling at the appropriate speed to catch multiple green lights in a row, was perfected by pioneering engineer Henry Barnes, 1907 to 1968, who also developed what was dubbed the Barnes Dance, or all pedestrian phase, during his time as Denver, which he brought to Baltimore when recruited by Mayor Tommy D'Alessandro Jr., father of U.S. House of Representatives leader Nancy Pelosi, and then to New York when recruited by Mayor Robert F. Wagner, where he served as the traffic commissioner. Uniformity in traffic regulations was important. If each state, or worse, municipality, had separate rules of behavior, travelers would have a hard time traveling from place to place. A uniform vehicle code was proposed by many in the industry and was largely adopted. Were streets a public utility to be regulated and controlled and for the public good, like street railways, water, or gas? Or were streets a marketplace to serve the individual demand of private travelers? A public utility is often thought of as an enterprise where competition is infeasible. There is no competition for the supply of roads. There is, of course, competition for the use of roads and for the use of the outputs of other public utilities. Ultimately, the Bureau of Public Roads started scientific investigations of driver and vehicle performance to improve road design and increase safety. Fifteen point four, transportation and traffic planning. Just about every city of some size undertook transportation and traffic planning during the 1910s or early 1920s to reconstitute streets for automobiles. Plans were sponsored by civic organizations. Great men, such as Daniel Burnham, were imported to make pronouncements and a fancy report followed. Typically, the first chapter said, What a fantastic city! Following chapters provided and discussed maps of arterials and land uses. Technical materials then provided street designs, including drainage, bridges, lighting, and so on. The plans also had fiscal and institutional recommendations. Local streets were to be paid for by special property assessments. Arterials were funded from citywide taxes. The city engineering office was to execute the plans. These authoritative plans were very successful, welcomed by various types of clients. The plans dictated what to do and how to do it. The imprint of these plans on cities can be seen today. Plans met the expectations of social critics. The automobile was welcome for many reasons, among them to reduce crowding and social tensions, to lower housing costs, to increase access to air and light. Finally, plans were consistent with the ways previous tasks had been undertaken, improved water supply, drainage, sewage works, streets, and the rebuilding of cities following fires. They were based on learning, and they took advantage of institutional resources already developed, institutions and procedures developed to handle public works, construction, and operations formed the core resources for planning. A new activity emerged, traffic studies responding to the failure of capacity additions to solve capacity problems. The transportation and traffic studies of the 1910s and 1920s did lead to the construction of physical facilities with the assumption that the facilities would handle the traffic. They did not. So the cities began to commission a new type of study. The review of a typical study will be helpful. Sponsored by the Chicago Association of Commerce, Miller McClintock's Metropolitan Street Traffic Survey for Chicago is an exemplar. It was done in the great man, powerful sponsor style. The Association of Commerce was the sponsor. McClintock, director of the street traffic research at Harvard, whom we met in section 15.3, was thus the great man. The existing situation was surveyed. Street use and congestion, factors complicating traffic flow, costs of congestion, 
traffic accidents and accident control, parking and pedestrian problems, traffic policy problems, traffic signals and signs, administration, traffic courts. This study recommended an ordinance that would create a division of traffic engineering in the Department of Public Works, reorganize the traffic division in the police department, standardize signs and signals, improve traffic law enforcement, create a city traffic commission. Studies of this type were common during the 1920s, and they continued with an intensified traffic safety flare into the 1930s. They didn't address financing, their recommendations were mainly operational in type, and beyond the passing of the ordinance, a city council matter, they split the responsibility for execution between two institutions, the police and the public works departments. Although traffic engineering had begun to take on an analytic stance during the period when these studies were done, there was a mismatch between the scientific fact-oriented views in the Federal Bureau of Public Roads and the style of the traffic studies. The bureaus developed facilities. The output of the traffic study was an ordinance. Traffic studies proceeded in the great man style. The bureau style was different. Where the bureau had been involved in urban areas, very rare, the bureau study style was different. Whatever the reason, this round of traffic studies in cities had little lasting impact aside from forming a market for the development of traffic engineering. The plans and their execution by city engineering departments tamed the problems of deployment of urban streets, but not traffic problems. The building of facilities did not take care of congestion, while traffic safety problems remained. Consequently, in later decades, the traffic problem emerged and re-emerged, and management of the traffic problem diverged somewhat from the management of the road infrastructure problem. We will refer again to the traffic debate, although it will not be pursued particularly in the discussions to follow. Fifteen point five free curb parking or who controls the roads as commons. Does prohibiting parking in neighborhoods respond to objections to the outsiders using the roads we labor to provide theme reported by Webb and Webb, nineteen thirteen, when they discussed outsiders using roads improved by local farmers, the situation when commerce was increasing and the toll road movement had not yet flowered? Is the concern that of protecting local communities from outside merchants and other influences, as reported for Rhode Island when toll roads were proposed? In My Own Private Idaho, S. Goffman used the subtitle, Staking Claims to the Public Streets. For years, public streets have been just that, public, and rights to use have been highly valued. And Goffman asks, why the turnaround? Why are local residents now able to take public or communal property streets for their private purposes? He reviews court cases and highlights a 1977 Supreme Court decision that has taken to allow most any resident only parking program on the theory that such programs reduce air pollution. That's interesting, but is reduced air pollution the motive for residents promoting restricted parking? Does restricted parking increase transit use and decrease emissions from vehicles? If it does, why are residents generally able to purchase parking permits for their visitors? Does restricted parking exercise local residents' feeling against commercial or other traffic attractions near their neighborhoods? Interested in property rights, Adler, 1985, has made the case for streets as communal property. He observed that streets became semi-private when residents implement restricted parking programs, and they have a private aspect when driveways require curb cuts and take space that could otherwise be used for parking. There are variations on communal and semi-private when time limits on parking are applied and when parking rights are restricted to neighborhoods or are applied citywide. Adler imagines a traffic destination, shopping, religious, school, or employment center, where there is parking spillover into neighborhood streets. As a matter of policy, is it in the public interest for those streets to be private, semi-private, or community property? Adler observes that welfare is maximized if streets are regarded as communal property and used by non-residents for parking. To engage in activities at the center, non-residents have driven some distance, and that effort implies the values that they place on parking. Unrestricted parking allows society to realize those values. Shoup argues there is no such thing as free parking and asks for cost-based parking fees or cash-out payments, say for employees who do not use the company parking lot. He suggests that by giving control of on-street parking to neighborhoods, revenue can be raised for many neighborhood public goods, such as street landscaping. 15.6 The 7% Solution Roads were popular, and the popularity of road improvements was pushed even before the auto by needs to get farm products to railheads and by use of bicycles. 
In addition to state and county initiatives, national-level legislators responded warmly to the needs for funds. The table gives a partial list of national legislation in the United States. The legislation framed the context of road planning. The 1916 Act referred to postal roads as a way to designate routes to be improved. The Act contained an interesting equity-oriented statement of purpose, including the need to decrease the isolation of rural settlements. Rural facilities were poor relative to urban. World War I reduced the federal role as resources were diverted to the war effort. Motorized military convoys, as noted in Section 7.3, made mincemeat of what paved roads were built, but nevertheless eventually were able to travel throughout the eastern United States. The 1921 Act had concentrated resources and triggered the establishment of state highway departments where they had not already been established. It also gave those departments specific turf, the 7% of all rural highways that would be on the ABC system. ABC refers to a classification of state highways eligible for federal funding. Planning came along in 1934 following BPR experiments with state planning. The federal aid system ultimately totaled over 271,000 kilometers and was far larger than the U.S. highway system as it included many local roads serving county seats, but not interstate travel. Why 7%? The number is arbitrary, of course, and may have resulted from the smallest number that would ensure senators in each western state could deliver both an east-west and a north-south highway, based on McDonald's experience in Iowa. State planning initiated as per the 1934 Act was not completely co-opted by needs and cost studies and by attention to construction of the interstate. Rather, it evolved into a fairly short-term routine leading to the planning placing of projects in the construction pipeline. Though the scope of the state versus the county road systems and how federal money would be divided was debated, the 7% solution for the allocation of federal money in the 1921 legislation co-opted some of the debate. Also, states worked out different solutions for allocating dollars between the counties and the state system. The give and take of state politics managed the county-state issue. During this period and into the 1940s, the rural emphasis of state programs continued. In 1928, there was an act allowing expenditures in the sparsely settled parts of cities, but such areas were essentially the rural parts of cities. The acts listed in Table 15.1 are not exhaustive. The 1934 Act extended federal aid to cities, a response to the Depression and unemployment problems of the times. The 1932 Act had stressed the same reasons in its emphasis on farm-to-market roads. The concentration on high-quality design can be traced as far back as the 1920s, Further, the acts leading to the interstate reflect on the inter interest in high-quality design. Bonds had been proposed to fund the interstate, but the 1956 Act adopted the fee and fuel tax protocols used by the states. The subsequent evolution of state-federal protocols is complex. An issue that should have been debated was the matter of rational shifts in the road pattern, given changes in the ratio of fixed to variable costs. In horse and mule days, variable costs were high relative to fixed costs, when compared to the case once auto and trucks came along. Consequently, there was an opportunity to reduce road mileage while providing improved quality roads. The rural system would be improved by mileage reductions and concentrating investments on remaining roads. Just as there was rationalization of the railroads, a rationalization of rural roads would be desirable. This fits the case of counties that are road poor in the sense that they have lots of mileage, but little in the way of economic activity to support the road system. Those counties are engaged in minimum maintenance, and they are allowing some paved roads to deteriorate to unpaved conditions. The retroversion of pavement to gravel may be warranted. Some planning that supported systematic reductions in the road network would be in order. Fifteen point seven: Financing roads, circa nineteen twenty. The booming automobile and the demand for roads led governments to seek a revenue source that would be fair, one which would charge users for the benefits they received, but did not have the disadvantages of tolls. In the 1910s, attempts at instituting a federal gas tax were defeated on the grounds that roads and streets were public and should be paid for by the general public, not just users. By the late 1910s, vehicle technology had shaken out so that most cars used a gasoline-powered internal combustion engine. The gas tax was first established in Oregon in 1919 at one cent per gallon. By the 1920s, local legislation overcame resistance from motorists to gas tax legislation by linking the tax to road bills. The idea was quickly emulated, and a decade later, the last state, New York, finally adapted a tax. Then it was raised a bit higher, leading to total national collections of about $450 million. Almost two decades after the gas tax began to pay for new roads, it was already time to start recapitalizing the system. 
Illinois, which had in 1938 more concrete roads than other states, found it would have to reconstruct the roads and had not at the time a way to finance this, as existing revenue sources were already dedicated to principal and interest payments. In 1932, the federal government followed the states, enacting a gasoline excise tax. Until 1956, with the passage of the Interstate Highway Act, funds raised by the gas tax were commingled with general revenue, though the amount of revenue was considered a benchmark for federal road spending. Between 1956 and 1983, all of the revenue went to the highway account, although in the 1970s provisions allowed the money to be spent on transit in cities that could not complete their interstate highways. After 1983, one cent out of the nine cent tax went to the mass transit account. From 1990 to 1996, some of the revenue was further diverted to general revenue to assist in deficit reductions. By 1997, of the 18.4 cent tax, 15.44 cents were spent on highways. The U.S. experience differs from that in other countries. Hypothecation, earmarking, or dedicating fuel taxes for road use is not nearly so common, since the revenue raised from fuel taxes far exceeds what is spent on roads. The practice is opposed by finance ministers who want freedom to act rather than having their hands tied. Great Britain effectively ended hypothecation in 1937, though it maintained a fictional road account for a number of years, in Australia in 1959. In the U.S., earmarking of transportation revenues for transportation services is natural and expected. And complaints about taxing transportation services for non-transportation uses arise immediately. In other countries, a fuel tax of $4 per gallon is tolerated. Financing transportation with either user fees or general revenue and using transportation revenues to finance other services are highly charged topics. U.S. counties often levy a property tax in lieu of having property owners devote workdays to road repair, the corvée system discussed in Chapter 3.3, to satisfy the demand for modern roads. With increases in the number of automobiles and trucks, the need for roads was seen as obvious, and in the early decades of the 20th century, increasing the property tax for roads presented no political problems. In a way, local governments solved the problem of building and maintaining the highway system in the same way the cities did local taxes paid for local roads. As was the case in the cities, the property tax base was augmented by the development of vehicle fees and fuel taxes beginning in the late 1910s. These own posts were widely adopted by the 1920s. While the pattern of fees and taxes differed from state to state, in almost every state farm trucks received favored treatment in tax systems. Roads were popular and the popularity of road improvements was pushed even before the auto, by the need to get farm products to railheads and by the use of bicycles. State and national legislators responded warmly to the need for funds. The figure shows the share of revenue spent on urban roads in 1920. Fees for vehicles ran about $10.70 for autos and $21.90 for all trucks. The states had instituted gasoline tax that ran about $0.04 cents per gallon. Imposts on trucks were running about $0.6 cents per ton kilometer. The situation varied from state to state, but in almost all states, the cities, sometimes via the counties, were receiving income from these taxes. For example, in California, urban counties were receiving about 50% of the taxes and fees paid by urban vehicles. At the national level, highway expenditures were running about $2 billion, and it was estimated that about $325 million were expended in cities. Special assessment districts were widely used, paying about one-half of the capital investment costs. Issues at the time were the cross-subsidy of rural roads by urban vehicle taxpayers, urban congestion, and the large part of the urban highway bill being paid by general taxes, although it was pointed out that urban vehicle owners used rural facilities for as much as a 60% of their travel, it was thought that the urban-to-rural subsidy situation was unstable. For example, an adjustment would be made. With respect to the contribution of general taxes on property to road expenditures, it was pointed out that urban street facilities had purposes other than carrying traffic. They were used for walking and recreation. They provided light and air to adjoining property. They provided right-of-way for utilities. Expenditures would be necessary even if there were no motorized vehicles. But even in 1920, the contribution of general taxes to streets was on the decrease. In 1903, 28% of city expenditures were for streets, and this had declined to 17% by 1923. Congestion was an issue in the 1920s, as it was before and as it is now. At the time, its management was via improvements in the street system, although it was recognized that there were limits on what could be done because of existing properties and the political and fiscal costs of taking property. 
Zoning was held out as the solution. It would assure property development that would allow adequate street spaces and distribute traffic-intensive land uses. Jacob Viner, a well-known economist at the University of Chicago, discussed the control of congestion by restricting the wasteful use of street space. He mentioned systems of charges on parking and on traffic and restrictions on truck traffic. He predicted, there will not be as much restriction on traffic as the prevailing conditions require, but adds, the public will submit in time to the painful necessities of the situation. The astute reader will have noted that the issues in 1920 largely remain unresolved. Land use is still considered a possible solution, as are pricing, parking, and traffic. The source of funds has shifted somewhat over 80 years and varies somewhat by region but the figure using data from the Twin Cities is representative. A surprisingly large amount of revenue comes from non-transportation sources. Students of federal-level data will tend to miss spending on local roads. While it is arguable to what extent that road spending is required for the purposes of moving people as opposed to accessing property, it is still spent on roads. What changed in 76 years? Property taxes are half as important. Special assessments are one-fourth as important. Gas taxes, highway earnings, from the state and federal government are about four times as important, and vehicle taxes are also four times as important. At this rate of change, in another century or so, road financing might actually be efficient. Fifteen point eight Bureau of Public Roads Thomas Harris MacDonald earned his place in history less as a visionary than as a relentless refiner of the existing. He was an engineer's engineer, a man gifted at recognizing a problem and developing a methodical plan for fixing it. He did nothing on spec, took no gambles. His decisions were founded on careful research, overlaid arguments, numbers, and accompanied by charts, measurements, cost figures, traffic counts, all of which made him the perfect man for the nation's top roads job in 1919, because the American highway system was a chaos of overlapping auto trails, disconnected state highways, dead ends, and dog legs, and McDonald was order personified. Earl Swift, The Big Roads, 2011. The BPR was established in the Department of Agriculture to aid in the improvement and construction of public roads and to promote better agricultural engineering work. Originally founded as the Office of Road Inquiry in 1893, the function of the office from its founding to 1912 was primarily educational conducting studies and disseminating information through lecture and publications. From 1912 onward, the agency expanded its power to include the construction of post roads, as authorized by the Constitution, and the administrative responsibility for federal aid programs. In the early part of this century, the Bureau of Public Roads encouraged states to develop statewide plans for the growing network of roads and highways. It is important to note the motive for these plans. Washington politicians made a commitment to assist highway development in the states, and significant funding became available. But there was never enough funding, and the BPR's response was to concentrate resources on through and important collector routes. Indeed, one of its first actions was the 7% solution. Only 7% of the state mileage was to be eligible for federal assistance. As we will see, the strategy to concentrate resources permeated the subsequent BPR freeway programs. In the early days, the BPR had a role limited to working out techniques and designs, demonstrating roads, and encouraging states to act. The result was a number of BPR-type roads. These roads failed badly under the traffic demands of World War I, indeed so badly that there was a political backlash against the Bureau. In response, and adopting the science is good for the country thinking after World War I, the Bureau adopted a rational scientific method approach in the 1920s. This orientation was successfully applied first to soil mechanics. In the 1920s and 30s, the Bureau was finding that facilities were becoming obsolete before they wore out, with higher velocity traffic designs needed upgrading. Also, traffic growth was pressing capacity. In response, the Bureau became involved in getting the travel and traffic facts to support planning and design. It began to go beyond recommending and required that states develop state plans as a condition for federal aid funding. The state surveys of transportation participated in by the Bureau were essentially identical in their organization, data analysis, and findings. State surveys from New Hampshire, Ohio, and Vermont illustrate the Bureau's early work. The surveys aim to provide not only a detailed description of the existing network, but also a plan for future highway development. Each survey contains a background description of the history of roadway development in the state, the organization of the individual state highway department, highway revenues and expenditures, and methods of state aid and supervision. 
There were minor variations among the plans, for instance, a discussion of significant geographical features in the New Hampshire survey and a greater discussion of the urban needs in the state role in the Ohio survey. Methods used in the survey were stressed. Data presented include descriptions of existing roadways by roadway type, measures of traffic density, truck and bus traffic, traffic composition, and classification and forecasts of highway traffic. Traffic density was measured as the number of motor vehicles that passed a count station during a 24-hour period, ADT, average daily traffic, and were classified as light, less than 200 ADT, medium, 200 to 499 ADT, and heavy, 500 and more ADT. Truck traffic and density, motor bus routes, interstate travel, and trip length data were also presented. Forecasts of future traffic and future motor vehicle registration were also developed. The final sections of the surveys proposed plans for future highway improvement, for example, five-year plans for Ohio and Vermont, a 10-year plan for New Hampshire. These plans outlined the extent of road needed to meet future demand, provided estimates of the cost for the proposed improvements, and discussed safety concerns, areas of growth, and special study needs. There was nothing radical or breakthrough in these early surveys. They scaled up project-type work and used the conventional engineering standards of the day. They illustrate the emerging relations between the Bureau and the states, the investing of primary responsibility in the states for development and maintenance of the highway network, with the federal government serving to establish both uniform standards and financing. A kind of partnership emerged, which is still a fundamental part of the U.S. Road Transportation Administration. The roles of the states and federal government have remained substantially the same. The plans also indicate a change in the role of the roadway network. Then primarily established as a roads to move agricultural products to rail facilities for long distance travel, the survey points to the development of a network that serves additional needs, including social, economic, national defense, and long distance transport. The increasing roles of the automobile and truck were recognized. The role could hardly have been overlooked at the time. But it is interesting that long distance truck transport was not much emphasized. The plans are key documents for the time, indicating the change and how it came about. In addition to the concentrate resources theme and the fact-based partnership theme, the BPR was very much a product of progressive government, professional leadership thinking in the early decades of the century. The longtime chief of the Bureau, Thomas MacDonald, and Bureau staff personified progressiveness. The progressive movement affected state and local government, of course, but its impact was concentrated in the Midwest and Western states. As discussed in Chapter 16, engineering studies and management confronted the City Beautiful movement. With the growth of motor vehicle use and the importance of the highway network, the role of the federal government expanded. The BPR, as part of the responsibility for administering federal aid for roads, required the states to submit plans for the existing road network. The organization of the state highway departments and the method for securing the necessary finances for road construction and maintenance. The state surveys were further developed as part of this process. The federal government viewed the relationship with the states as a cooperative partnership, and while it provided some funding, did no road building itself. At the request of McDonald, the U.S. Army prepared the 75,000-mile, 120,000-kilometer Pershing map, an early interstate highway map that reflected the wishes of the Army in providing roads that would connect important locations, and was developed based on the bad experiences of the Army in the transcontinental motor convoys. Much of this map was eventually constructed as U.S. or interstate highways. The Bureau also began to make resources available for planning. The Federal Aid Highway Act of 1934 authorized expenditures of 1.5% of federal monies made available to states for surveys, plans, engineering, and economic analysis of projects for future construction. And by 1940, all the states had created highway planning surveys. The Bureau began to tiptoe into the urban area. Urban area travel studies were not included in the highway planning surveys until 1944 because it was not until the 1944 Act that appreciable federal funds were made available to urban areas. In anticipation of that act, the Bureau had developed a method to give the needed information and refer to origin and destination of trips, mode of travel, and trip purpose. The federal government prioritized rural and intercity travel during the 1930s. As mentioned, there was the problem that early road designs were inadequate to the growth of traffic, number of vehicles, size of trucks, etc., and a modernization and replacement program was needed. Local agencies were making claims on highway user taxes. Should trucks pay highway taxes? Finally, the state secondary road system for which funds were beginning to become available needed to be identified. These problems called for facts, and the highway planning surveys responded. Study techniques were honed and began to include financial topics and road life analyses.
15.9 Discussion Highway Needs The word needs is a tough one to work with. How do we establish need for a highway improvement? Needs were operationalized by the 7% solution in the 1921 Act, and that was tempered in 1932 by legislation that said that states could increase their mileage by 1% per year when the original 7% was 90% complete and well maintained. In other words, there is no limit to needs, they grow 1% per year. The 1934 legislation provided for state highway planning and the states gradually built up planning capabilities. Although the BPR suggested procedures and the contents of plans, those plans varied somewhat from state to state and yielded no results in the rationalist facts style desired by the Bureau. At the end of World War II, the Automotive Safety Foundation undertook some need studies for several states and these yielded facts. The Bureau recommended the study strategy to the states, calling attention in particular to the Automotive Safety Foundation study in California. At first, the need studies that followed BPR urging were made on an episodic timing and were sponsored by legislators. A study commission was established with advisory committees. A sizable staff, budget, and block of time were devoted to the work. Staff was largely engineering, but included legal and fiscal specialists. The resulting needs were then considered by the legislature. Currently, need studies respond both to local interests and to Congress. Congress requires that the U.S. DOT report to Congress on the condition, performance, and future capital investment requirements of the nation's highway and transit systems. This report is carried out every two to three years. The highway condition information is drawn from the Highway Performance Monitoring System, HPMS, which is a federal database fed by state DOTs. The cost to improve highways and bridges is developed from the Federal Highway Administration's Highway Economics Requirement System, HERS, or HERS, in the National Bridge Investment Analysis, NBIA. HERS determines investment requirements by using the HPMS data on pavement, geometry, traffic volumes, vehicle mix, and other characteristics at the road segment level, and making changes to the road segment to evaluate the benefit-cost ratio. It chooses the improvements that produce the greatest benefit for the purpose of estimating recommended improvements. It aggregates the results over all the road segments and statistically adjusts the results to get a national estimate. It thus approximates local decision-making, though, of course, each project still has its own much more detailed analysis before it actually gets funded. Roads can be improved in a number of dimensions, including the capacity of the road, the strength of the pavement, and the strength of the bridges. For pavements, a serviceability index, which depends on cracking variance of slope and amount of patching, is applied and projected into the future. Sufficiency ratings are also used for pavements and bridges. As stated, today the need studies are made in the states in a style largely mandated by the federal government. Manuals of procedure, computer information systems, and analysis programs are extensively used, embedded in the Highway Performance Monitoring System, which includes data on the extent, condition, performance, use, and operating characteristics of roads. For instance, the pavement condition is measured on an index from 0, extremely poor, to 5, extremely good. That measurement produces its PSI, Pavement Serviceability Index. Typically, new roads have a PSI of 4.5, and roads are mended when the PSI drops to about 2.5. It is generally agreed that the need studies do what they say they do. Even so, there is much to criticize. For example, a need may be recognized to increase the width of an arterial in a residential area, and the cost of that action included in dollar needs. But as a practical matter, that monetary cost should not be included because the political social cost of the improvement makes it highly unlikely. Alternatively put, the political and social costs plus the monetary costs outweigh the benefits, indicating that it has a net negative net present value, and is thus not a need. Two, there are diverse pavement or traffic management strategies that might be less costly than the one incorporated in the analysis system. Moreover, the studies are not very demand sensitive. Engineering standards drive needs. The situation is in considerable disarray. Can we get at needs in a better way? Can we change the point of view of cost studies? Are additional styles of planning required? The need study is straightforward in concept, but it is hard to know what goes on inside the black box used when calculations are made. Seemingly simple changes in standards or, and or calculation methods can change results. Everybody says we need more demand-oriented methods to estimate needs, and the studies have responded by including calculations based on traffic. But is that the answer? Recently, for example, the studies have been performing triage in low-volume rural roads. The need studies find no need because of light traffic use. The incremental cost method was established to assign costs of construction. Should we go to cost methods more responsive to the marginal costs of using the system? An alternative way to allocate costs is to charge based on benefits received rather than costs occasioned. Thus, those who benefit most would pay the most. 
This is more difficult to determine, especially in an unpriced system. Vehicles do not pay for each segment at each time, rather they currently pay for their share of the system. The story of roads continues in chapter 22.